Father, thank you for your amazing goodness to us. And God, your unfailing love, the grace that you pour out. Father, open up our ears, open up my mouth, help me to speak with clarity. But let us hear what you would speak to us today, to take away and to apply what you would like us to today, to change us, to become more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There was this older gentleman that uh, lived all alone, and he wanted to plant his annual tomato garden, but it was really, really, really difficult work because the ground was super hard. And his only son, Vincent, um, who always helped him in the years past, was actually in prison. So the old man wrote a letter to his son describing, describing his predicament. Dear Vincent, I'm pretty sad because it looks like I won't be able to plant my tomato garden this year. I'm just getting too old to be digging up a garden. I know that if you were here, my troubles would all be over because I know that you'd be happy to dig up the plot for me, like in the old days. Love, Dad. A few days later, Dad received a letter from his son. Dear Dad, don't dig up that garden. That's where the bodies are buried. Love, Vinny. <laughs> At 4 a.m. the next morning, FBI agents and local police arrived and dug the entire area up find without finding any bodies. They apologized to the old man, and they left. The very same day, the old man received a letter from his son. Dear Dad, you're welcome. Love, Vinny. <laughs> uh, yeah. When I uh, was thinking about what the Lord would have me speak on today, I thought I knew, and been praying about it, thinking about it all week, sat down to start, you know, looking and digging, and, and I talked to Lonnie about this. I said, so is this what happens to you? Um, because you think you're going in a direction, and then God says, no, steer here. Then he says, um, not quite go this way, okay, now you're on. And I knew when I heard correctly when I was on, and I'm actually gonna be talking today about how your garden grows. And um, I know some of you have been spending a lot of time out digging up your plots. Hopefully you don't find any dead bodies, but <laughs> um, you know, we all do that. And we all, or a lot of us are doing that right now, this time of year, we're working on our gardening. Um, and I love this time of year, I love this time of year in the garden. Um, but why do we garden? There's an end result that we're looking for, and that's to reap a harvest. And um, we can count on the right harvest if we plant the right seed and we tend to the garden. Galatians 6, 7 through 10. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith, or of the household of the faith. Um, the first line there, do not be deceived. You know, we can try to fool ourselves all we want into thinking that we have sown good seed and that we're going to reap a good crop. But God is not mocked. God cannot be deceived. God is not fooled. We will get what we plant and what we tend to, whether good or bad. It says all throughout the word, and particularly in Psalms, that the reward will eventually arrive. It seems a lot of the time, like the wicked prosper and the godly struggle, God promises, though, that in the end, there will be an appropriate harvest. The gardens of our lives, you know, this is a flesh versus spirit thing. That's really what our lives can look like. It's that battle. It's a natural tendency of what direction our lives could go versus a spiritual course. 
that our lives could go. It's a let it fall where it just may versus hard work and being attentive thing. That's the way gardens are. Galatians 5, 16 through 24. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Remember I said flesh versus spirit. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. So, everything else. So, just because you don't think you fall into one of those categories, or I don't fall into one of those, and things like these. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice Keep that word in mind. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Flesh versus spirit. You know, when I look at these lists, I naturally gravitate toward the ones I like and the do ones I don't like, the ones I categorize. I kind of have this um, system of thinking that some of them are more like the, f the fruits of the flesh. Some of them are a little more distasteful than others. Um, how can um, you know idolatry and sorcery and immorality be right alongside envying and jealousy? I mean, really? Come on. You know, the other seems so much worse than if I envy or if I'm jealous um, or outbursts of anger. How many of you have not had an outburst of anger, even internally? And a little side note there, you know, Jesus said, you know, it was said, and don't quote me verbatim, but basically he's saying it was said that if murder you murder, then, you know, that's what the Old Testament says. It talks about murdering, and it talks about um, adultery. But Jesus said, even if you think against your brother, the internal, it's not just the act, it's the internal thing. Even if you think against your brother, even if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery. So the inside life, okay? But I also, in looking at the fruit of the Spirit, would all of you agree that the hardest thing on that list to operate in is self-control? Um, I, I think that, for me, I'll say that the hardest thing is there on there is to operate in most of the time is self-control. But these are available to us, the fruits of the Spirit, if we so choose. So I'm going to talk today about gardening. Um, because of when we say yes to Jesus, we now have God's spirit living in us. And we can produce, this is, there is such potential of good harvest in us once we say yes to Jesus because the spirit of God now lives in us. And so these fruits of the spirit are available to us, the potential for them. Um, gardening. I'm going to talk about soil. I'm going to talk about the plants or the seeds that we plant. I'm going to talk about the daily grind of gardening, and then I'm going to talk about the harvest. Anybody that's been gardening for very long knows how important the soil is and the condition of the soil. Now, you could just go out there in the road ditch and dig a hole and plant a tomato in it. What do you think would happen if you just walked away from it and left it alone especially? 
Um, you know, I see people that randomly just go dig up whatever soil is on their property, put it in pots, and start, try to start seeds in it. Um, you're not going to have a productive harvest um, because the soil is that important. It is the foundation of everything, and it makes all the difference in the gardens of our lives. Matthew 13, 3 through 9 and then 18 through 23. And he spoke many times to them in parables, he being Jesus, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang, they sprang up because they had, excuse me, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. So it took longer for them to germ, or they, they immediately germinated. But when the sun then was risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. And then disciples are like, why are you always talking in parables? We don't get it. Tell us what this means, Jesus. So a few verses down, in, starting in verse 18, he describes, he explains, gives commentary on the parable. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is a man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And we know that persecution and affliction will arise. It is in our lives, so it's coming, or if it's not here already. Um, verse 22 and the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is a man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. What kind of soil is my life comprised of? How can I improve the soil of my life? I want to start at the very foundation, though, even before we talk about, because we have to build on the, the immediate most important thing is our relationship with Jesus Christ, our strong yes in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to start at the very beginning. I'm just very simply the gospel of Christ. We have to first of all believe that God exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him that the Bible, I don't have mine up here because I printed off all my scriptures, that is the word of God to us. If, if, if we want to complain about God never speaking to us and God never giving us direction, look at the Bible. That is a resource that's always at our fingertips, okay? Um, so the Bible is the word of God. We are all created by him for his purpose and glory. Every man, that, man, woman, and child that ever did exist, everybody from beginning of history to the very end, whenever the end is, is has been created for the, the purpose of bringing glory to God, period. Whether we say yes or no to that is the choice that he gives us. But you and I are created to bring glory to God. We are created beings, and we're not just created beings, we are eternal beings, and we're either gonna, we are eternal. We're going to spend eternity in one of two places. We either say yes to Jesus and spend it in heaven, or by default, we will, we will spend it in eternal death, in hell, period. Now, you and I and everybody else out there can think this is all, can, can embrace this as truth, or we can reject it as oh, just a bunch of old wives' tales. That doesn't negate the fact that it's truth. We still have, I mean, every one of us is going to be held accountable for saying yes or no to this. 
okay, period. So I'm just starting at the very, very, very bottom foundation here. Um, no one can come into relationship with our Heavenly Father, with our Creator, except through Jesus. He is the only way. There are, all roads do not lead to Rome. Not even living a life of good works will get you to heaven. I don't care if you gave millions of dollars to dying children in Africa. That will not get you to heaven. Saying yes to Jesus will get you to heaven, will bring you into relationship with your creator God, with your heavenly father. There is a price that has to be paid for our sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blood has to be shed. It's either our blood and we pay the price, or we say yes to the price that Jesus has already paid, and we say yes to Jesus. That is a gift that is freely offered. I get to say yes, or I get to say no. It is my choice. Saying yes to Jesus is how we get to heaven, and how we get to have an abundant life here, bringing glory to his name, or by default, it's a no. There, there is no maybe, there is no gray. It's yes or no. So let's start there, period. It doesn't matter if I adhere to it or if you adhere to it, if I believe it, if you believe it, if I live it, if you live it, it is absolute, complete, black and white truth. So now let's talk about the soil. When we have soil in a garden, one of the best things to do, which I have never done in all my gardening years, is to have my soil tested, to take it into the extension office and to have it tested to see what's in it. How many, have any of you ever had yours tested to see what your soil is comprised of and what it's weak in? Oh, of course you have. Of course you have. Y'all, your pasture land, that would make sense. So we have to tend to the soil. Um, Psalm 26.2, examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. What am I missing in the soil, Lord? What components are missing? Where am I weak? What do I have maybe too much of? You know? We can add things to the soil. Actually, this year um, is only the second time I've done this. I made a homemade fertilizer um, with some components. There's rock phosphate, um, cottonseed meal, kelp meal, and dolomite in it. And um, I've done it twice. I did it the first year we gardened, which was the year I was pregnant with Anna. And um, then we, um, and I still remember, thank you, Mary Lee. She, she brought me loads and loads and loads of manure that was the foundation of the soil in our garden. They weren't even going to church here. She <laughs> brought me all of this. She also brought me, um, a, <laughs> I'm still fighting it. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. She, she helped me sow some tares in my garden, but anyway. Um, but so I made this fertilizer. And how did I know how to make this fertilizer? I read it in a book that was written by an expert that knows the game. That is tried and true. And actually this book, in fact, when I came in this morning, Brandon's like, oh, Steve Solomon's book. Yeah, you can tell how well, I mean, it's like shredded here. And you can tell what I read most because, you know, where the pages that I read most because that's where it turns to. Um, but Growing Vegetables West of the Cascades by Steve Solomon. Steve Solomon um, owned Territorial Seed Company. He no longer does, but um, he owned Territorial Seed Company. And he is the guru. And Dory owns the book, too. Um, but uh, anyway, I read a book written by an expert is how I found that what to add to my soil, what to put in my soil. And um, I also put a lot of composted manure in it and, uh, and things to improve the soil. I do use miracle Grow. Even Steve Solomon says there's nothing like miracle Grow when it comes to mudding and transplants. So if Steve Solomon says it, I believe it. But so I read this book written by an expert. Well, guess what? The Word of God is the expertly written manual for the garden of our lives, period. Okay. Um, if we want to know how to live our life, we need to read the Word of God. It is full of expert advice. 
on living a life that is abundant and fruitful and produces a harvest. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Some of that doesn't sound like very fun, reproof and correction, but I'm correcting my soil by adding some things to it. Um, Lonnie has said this before, and I don't know where he got it, but the Bible is an acrostic, Bible is an acrostic for basic instructions before leaving earth. <laughs> um, it's the manual for the garden of my life, but if I don't read it, I'm not going to know what kind of life God wants for me. What else can I do to improve the soil of my heart? I said it before, the Spirit of God, when we give our yes to Jesus, the Spirit of God comes to dwell in us. 1 Corinthians 2.12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. God's Spirit dwells in us when we say yes to Jesus. The Spirit teaches us God's ways. Being in relationship with other Jesus followers is also a vital way to improve the condition of the soil of our lives. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You know, when you think about iron sharpening iron, I, I picture a blacksmith shop, and there's a lot of sparks that fly. And that's what happens in community sometimes, in relationship. A lot of the time, there can be friction and sparks that fly. But you know what? It sharpens us. Relationship within the body of Christ sharpens us. We improve one another's soil through love, serving, accountability, and encouragement. It allows for growth and health when we're in relationship with other believers. It improves the soil of our lives. The planting of the seeds. The process of planting a garden is, a literal garden, is dependent on what zone you live in. And I don't know about you, but every year I have to look it up again. So what zone is 97122? Um, and then I look up my little list of what I can plant when and all of that. But you know what? Each one of us have our own little microclimate. What grows in my little microclimate here in Hebo is different than what Michael and Sarah can grow. And even what Michael and Sarah can grow successfully and produce a harvest may be different from David and Dory. And they just live right down the road, depending on how much shade, how much sun, how the wind blows. And it's much different than what John and Karen can grow. I mean, they live, it's another zip code they live in, but they have a much colder and windier climate where they live. Their microclimate is different, even though we don't live that many miles away from each other. There is a lot of difference in what we can and can't grow, what is successful and what isn't. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people recommend to me a certain vegetable variety that they just love and that grows really well in their garden. And so I take their, their advice and I go ahead and I plant that particular vegetable. And what happens a lot of times is one or both of two things. Either it doesn't thrive in my, my garden or I don't like it. There's that too. I mean, I am not going to plant eggplant. I don't care how much you like eggplant. I am not going to plant eggplant. And I finally this year have decided not to grow beets because I am the only one in our household that will eat them. Lonnie and Anna won't eat them, and I still have all, of, believe it or not, all of last year's crop of beets still in my garden. Now, they're, they're just fine, and I'm eating on them, but I can only eat, you know, like, I can't eat beets every day. One beet a day, or one beet a week, maybe. So they're still growing in my garden. I'm not planting beets this year because it's like, why? Why do I have to plant beets if... Nobody else is going to eat beets. So anyway, so I've decided I'm not planting beets this year. Abundant harvest, yeah. Um, so each one of our gardens is unique and individual in how God 
equips us in our little microclimate. What he, how he wants to use us to plant in his kingdom. We're all gonna look different. We each have unique opportunities. We each have unique giftings. We are each individuals. This here is my box of seeds. Be it what it may, this is how I keep all my seeds. And I try to keep it in the freezer sometimes, but during garden season, which in my life is probably about four months long, it's just out on my kitchen counter. So I don't know how much good it is to keep it in the freezer the rest of the year. But, um, and I only start keeping it in the freezer probably keeping her seeds in the freezer. So I started keeping mine there. But anyway, is it super organized or as organized as some? Probably not. I do have like with like. Um, I have some seed in here that is probably. And so um, this is my unique little package of seeds right there. And this is my very crude drawing, which none of you can see probably, of how my tentative garden was going to be laid out this year. And it's changed a little bit since I first wrote this. Um, but that's okay. It changed, it's kind of changing as we go on. Um, I had to, I planted greens this week, but they didn't go where that little chart says that they are. Um, it didn't, doesn't quite look the way that I thought it was going to. Romans 12, 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. And then... As this, these verses go on, I'm not going to read them. Paul goes on to say, if you prophesy, then blah, blah, blah. If you teach, then blah, blah, blah. If you serve, then blah, blah, blah. Each of us have, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. You know, sometimes I don't understand what another person is planting because it d doesn't look like my garden. Sometimes I think my garden actually should look like your garden. Or I think your garden should look like my garden. But this isn't the way that God works in and through his kids. Our lives do have to line up with the word of God. Okay? When I talk about diversity and variety, that doesn't mean anything goes. There are, there's a life of holiness that God expects us to live. The word talks about it. We cannot deny there are parameters of safety that God boundaries. He hedges us in with the way to live our lives. We have to line up with that. But there's a lot of freedom in what that looks like. Every tongue, tribe, and nation will one day worship at the feet of Jesus together. And you know what? Most of them aren't going to look like me. There's going to be a lot of variety and diversity. Don't get caught up in what somebody else's life looks like, what their gifts are, what their opportunities have been, what their garden looks like. Tend to your own by applying the Bible, by listening to the Holy Spirit, and by using the, gift, the gifts that are uniquely yours to use for God's glory, for what he has created you for. We're going to spin our wheels if we continue to compare ourselves with others or if we want everybody to look like us. Now, this is the hardest part of gardening that I'm going to talk about next. It's the daily grind, OK? The watering, the weeding, the watching out for disease, and the pest control. The gardener has to stay on top of all these things daily. We all know what happens in a garden when we get lazy, when we're sick, when we get tired, when we have to leave town for a few days, when the summer heat hits and we really don't want to get out there and water twice a day. But we all know what happens if we don't. 
I mean, just like that, within 12 hours, you can lose half your garden if we get like 115 degree weather, right? Tending our lives, our gardens, it, garden is about developing consistent habits. But habits start just with a thought. Then they become an action, which becomes a habit that is done over and over and over again. And when that is done over and over and over again, it becomes our character. And our character becomes our destiny. It starts with a thought. Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinks, so he is. Do you water your life daily with the truth from God's word, from the Bible? Do you feed on what God wants to say to you personally? You know, Sunday sermons are only dessert. Lonnie and I were talking about that this week. Sunday sermons really are what you hear here on a Sunday, what you experience here on a Sunday. Yes, it is important, but it cannot be the core of your spiritual life. Because if it is, you will remain immature and not produce a large harvest. We can't thrive on dessert. You know what would happen if I only ate chocolate chip cookies all the time? I probably wouldn't feel so hot. I love chocolate chip cookies, probably a little too much, but we need meat, we need substance. Sunday teaching, Lonnie has said this before, Sunday teaching is just regurgitated food. Think about that. Not a very pleasant thought, actually, if that's what you're living on. This may be a hard thing to take in, but this is truth, you guys. Hopefully, whomever you do listen to, myself, Lonnie, anyone else who you like to listen to and on YouTube or whatever, you know, is rightly dividing the word of truth. But you are responsible for eating and drinking on a daily basis yourself, the daily grind. You have to develop the habit of reading and studying the Bible if you want to grow in your yes to Jesus. Start somewhere. You know, some, a lot of times I'll tell people to start with the book of John. Um, because it's the heart of Jesus. John was considered Jesus' beloved, and um, he, ex he really knows the heart of Jesus and explains it well in the gospel that he wrote. Um, the Psalms are really good. David wrote about half the Psalms, King David, and he was called a man after God's own heart, even though he was a murderer and an adulterer but he was a man after God's own heart because he was humble and he immediately repented when he was convicted of his sin. Now, there were repercussions for those sins, yes, but he was a man after God's own heart, and he taps into the heart of the Father through his human heart. And he, it is such a, Psalms, the Psalms are so beautiful and so human um, in the human, the human experience. David does an amazing job in the Psalms that he wrote. Um, and a, a lot of times to young men, I suggest to read the book of Proverbs. It's a lot about self-control. Um, I personally sometimes, if I am not, especially when I get into the begats and the begots, I will do it on audio Bible, and I have somebody read it to me. Because trying to get through all of those names that nobody knows how to pronounce, is really hard, so I listen to it on audio. Listen, to, get an audio Bible. There are a lot of them online, free apps that you can get if that's easier. Hebrews 5.14. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice, remember I said habits, because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. If you want to know how to discern good and evil, practice. Develop godly habits in your life. And the reading of the word is priority and primary. Engage with what God has given us in that amazing gift. Practice, habit. Remember, thoughts become actions, become habits, become character, become destiny. You sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. You sow generously, you're going to reap generously, period. So in your own garden, what's it like if you don't pull the weeds when they're small? 
when you don't pull sin out when it's tiny, it becomes non-tiny, doesn't it? And those roots get deeper and deeper and deeper, and the weed gets bigger and bigger and bigger. When I first have a twinge of conviction, it's easiest to deal with my sin when it's just a baby sin. I have some insidious weeds in my garden, merely, that... <laughs> That I have to stay on top of, I love you, I'm just, you know I'm teasing you, okay? Um, I have to stay on top of them or they're going to spread like wildfire. I have to stay on top of the morning glory. These are things in my garden that are maybe unique to my garden that I have to stay on top of or they take over my garden. If I yank them out when they're tiny, I can keep them under control. Do you understand that man's nature is naturally sinful? If we are left to ourselves, we will choose a sinful life, period. We will follow the natural course of deeds of the flesh if we just let things go and think that it's no big deal because it's just a tiny thing. That no big deal weed gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it gets harder and harder and harder to pull once we decide to pull it. Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Do not hide the weeds in your life. Take care of them when they're tiny. And if they are big and you know there's something that's perpetual, like the morning glory and the sour grass in my garden, and those are the things that plague me, I have to keep at it, I have to keep at it, I have to keep at it. And I have to make it a habit to take care of those. If you have a big weed in your life, like there's a temptation that you struggle with giving into over and over and over again, stay on it, get help, read the word, go to a godly counselor, have people pray with you. It is overcomable, which is probably not a word, but you can overcome even if it's a big weed, even if that tap root runs deeply. The same thing goes for diseases and pests in the garden. It is always easier to get on top of them when they are first noticed. The scab on my fruit trees, the aphids, the cutworms, the cabbage moths, they are persistent and destructive. I spray all of my brassicas multiple times once they start growing. I spray all of them with something called thuricide. It is a naturally occurring bacteria that will actually make the little cabbage worms, they eat this, the, they drink the liquid, eat it, and it makes them explode because they can't go to the bathroom. That's actually how thuricide works. So anyway, I have done this for years, and I listen, and the man, yeah, um, so, um, but, it helps me to have a better harvest because my cabbage, baby cabbage plants and my baby broccoli plants and my, all my other brassicas don't get demolished by those stupid little white moths that like to lay their eggs on all of those plants. And then, you know, I mean, there's nothing more gross than taking a head of broccoli into the house and washing it and then seeing all these floating worms in the water. Blah. And then to think how many I've actually eaten without seeing. Blah. But anyway, so I have to be diligent and I have to persevere. This year I'm actually laying a, a layer of um, a, a light cloth that is to keep all those cabbage moths off of all of my brassicas this year. Plus I'm going to spray thuricide on them every two weeks. So I am going to get those buddies. It is a war. It is a war. It is a war. You know, um, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is good at his job. He doesn't just come in and say, hi, I'm Satan, and I'm here to steal, kill, and destroy. Nope. He tempts us and coerces us and convinces us that that little white lie is no big deal that looking at that porn video just once is, is okay, that I deserve to give in to my flesh because I've had a rough day, that because I feel a certain way, 
I can give into sin because it's going to soothe me, that because the so-and-so hurt me, then I can hold unforgiveness toward them, that I can harbor self-righteousness because I know I'm right and you're wrong, that it's okay to think and speak critically of others because it's obvious to the most casual observer that they're wrong. And the list goes on and on and on. And that's how Satan works. He plants a thought. That becomes an action. That becomes a habit. That becomes our character. That becomes our destiny. And what are we going to harvest? Pretty soon, that one thought becomes the very end result. That's what it manifests in, into. Proverbs 4, 23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. This means that watching over our heart determines the course of our lives. If I plant a garden, even if I have good soil and I plant good seed and I walk away from it, am I going to have a harvest? There might be a few piddly things that survive and that poke themselves through the weeds, through all of my morning glory and all of the, oh, I just have stuff everywhere that is insidious in coming up, that if I don't stay on top of it, it takes its natural course. It follows the ways of the flesh instead of the ways of the spirit. That is what will happen if we do not do the daily grind, if we do not watch over our hearts with all diligence. It determines the course of our lives. My garden doesn't produce well unless I am purposeful, mindful, and intentional about preparing and planning and watering and tending to it during the entire season. I don't get a good harvest unless I remain focused and I work hard. It is going to naturally submit to the elements, the weeds, the diseases, the pests. But if I stay focused and I strengthen, do what I, I choose to strengthen my yes in Jesus, it is going to produce a harvest, a good harvest, an abundant harvest. My garden will be fruitful. You know, in the natural, I'm going to admit, when I get to the place in the heat of summer, I am sick of gardening. I am tired of watering. I don't want to see another zucchini or cucumber. I... Like, I ignore the weeds, it starts getting ugly, everything is scraggly, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. It is not as exciting as it was in the spring. I'm just like, seriously, will somebody please just come, you know, Lonnie, just take a weed eater to the whole thing, please. I am done. <laughs> but it can't be that way in our lives. We have to have the mindset of a farmer, not a fast food chain. <laughs> when it comes to following Jesus, we have to have the mindset of a farmer. We have to wait and work hard for the harvest. We have to keep working, keep growing closer to Jesus, keep trusting God, keep saying no to our flesh, keep repenting, keep enduring. James 5, 7 through 11. Joyce could quote it for me. I hear over there going, mm-hmm. <laughs> Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, like Lonnie was talking about this morning. We count those blessed who endured. If they hadn't endured, we wouldn't be reading what they wrote. You've heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is full of compassion and merciful. Galatians 6, 9, back to the beginning. If there's nothing else you take away from this, Galatians 6, 9, let us not lose heart in doing good, 
or in due time we'll, we'll, we will reap if we do not grow weary. If we tend to the foundation, the unique way that God has called us to plant, and we're diligent to establish good habits, we will reap a good, fruitful, abundant harvest. One day our Lord, our Master, our Jesus, our Father, our God is going to look at us, you guys. If we endure, if we keep tending our gardens, if we pay attention, he's going to look at us and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. But we have to endure to the end. We cannot grow weary in tending the garden of our lives. You have to make the choice. I have to make the choice. We need to strengthen our yes in Jesus. Stay in the word. Stay in fellowship. Listen to the Holy Spirit convicting you about the sins, the weaknesses, the things you need to amend your soil with. We all have them. How I'm tempted may not be the way you're tempted, but we all have them. Repent quickly. Stay in the word. Get in the word if you're not in the word. Please, 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 especially as the end approaches, because it's approaching, you guys. And I know they talked about that, and people say, well, they were saying that in the, Old Te or the New Testament, so whatever. It didn't happen then. It ain't going to happen for in my lifetime. We don't know that. We need to live as though that is the way. Okay. Father, thank you. Father, thank you that you give us everything we have need of to live an abundant, fruitful life. Everything that every single one of us need. You've given us Jesus the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to relationship with you, God, except through your son, Jesus, except through our yes to your son, Jesus. And then, Father, give us the strength to tend our gardens well, to endure to the end, to not give up when it gets hot and dry, to not give up when there are more and more weeds springing up, when there's more and more pressure, when the, the, per, the persecution starts in. Help us to not give up, that we keep on keeping on, God. Give us the strength. Thank you for the family of God that we can walk alongside of, encouraging, loving on one another, serving one another. God, you have given us so much, everything we have need of to live this life and attend our gardens well. Show us by your Holy Spirit those weak places, those sins in our lives, those places maybe that need more water. Show us, God, we each have them. Help us to come in humility, just like King David did. To say, uh, yeah, that was me. I'm the murderer. I'm the adulterer. God, we submit ourselves to you, to your teaching, just the conviction by your Holy Spirit, the teaching of your word. Everything we have need of is at our fingertips. Is available to us 24-7. And we are grateful for that today, Father. We submit ourselves to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Guys, I'll pray with any of you. Lonnie is willing to. If there's somebody else you'd rather go to, to um, you have a relationship with, that you'd like to get prayer, please. This is what the body of Christ is for, is to encourage, to pray with, to speak into one another's lives. I need you, and you need me. We're not going to make it without one another. You can point out weeds in my garden to me that I may not see. 
You can maybe give me a little extra water if I have a, you know, if I've run out of water. So, what's that? I don't, well, I, I, there's never enough seeds. <laughs> right, Karen? Isn't, isn't it always tempting? <laughs> anyway, please come and ask for prayer if you want it, if you'd like me to pray with you after the service, um, and, or if you'd like to go to somebody else. Reach out, guys. If you're struggling, make a phone call. If God lays somebody on your heart, call them. Take them out to coffee. Take them out to lunch. Spend some time. If it's just texting, don't live your life isolated. Reach out, okay? I love you.